Good morning. Good morning. Good to have all of you here on a snowy, slippery morning um, as the weather continues to do fun things to us. I think it's supposed to be 40 again by Wednesday or something like that. But anyway, good to have you all with us as we, as we gather as God's people this morning. Thanks to the band for joining us and for giving us the, the, the rhythm and the, the, the tunes and the notes. We appreciate that, along with the energy. Thank you for your gifts. We have some prayer concerns that we want to lift up this morning as we begin our worship. Uh, we want to keep Gaylord Bruin in our prayers. Gaylord has been hospitalized at Sparta and will probably continue to be there for at least, I think, maybe another week. I'm not sure, but we a little bit yet. So please continue to keep Gaylord in your prayers. We want to keep Lisa Wedlock in our prayers. She had some uh, outpatient surgery on Thursday, Thursday in his home and, and doing well. We also, um, a couple things here. First of all, we want to uh, acknowledge, welcome back, Rich and Ann and Ashley Garbers from sunny Florida. But they are here because of Rich's dad's funeral. And, and so we wish you were not here, quite frankly, but, but if you understand. But we want to keep their family in our prayers as they grieve uh, Rich's dad, whose name was Rich, Rich's loss. And the flowers over here by the collector are from that, uh, from that funeral. So we will keep you in our prayers as we worship today and as the week um, ahead of the phones. Our opening hymn is hymn number 641. As you are comfortable, would you please rise?
Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And also with you. Compassionate God, you gather the whole universe into your radiant presence and continually reveal your Son as our Savior. Bring wholeness to all that is broken and speak truth to us in our confusion that all creation will see and know your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. chapter of 1 Corinthians. Now concerning food sacrificed to idols, we know that all of us possess knowledge. Knowledge puffs up, but <coughs> love builds up. Anyone who claims to know something does not yet have the necessary knowledge, but anyone who loves God is known by Him. Hence, as to the eating of food offered, offered to idols, we know that no idol in the world really exists. And there is no God but one. Indeed, even though there may be so-called gods in heaven or on earth, as in fact there are many gods and many lords, yet for us there is one God the Father, for whom all things and for whom we exist, and one Lord Jesus Christ, through whom are all things and through whom we exist. It is not everyone, however, who has this knowledge. Since some have become so accustomed to idols until now, they still think of the food they eat as food offered to an idol. And their conscience, being weak, is defiled. Food will not bring us close to God. We are no worse off if we do not eat, and no better off if we do. But take care that this liberty of yours does not somehow become a stumbling block to the weak. For if others see you, who possess knowledge, eating in the temple of an idol, might they not, since their conscience is weak, be encouraged to the point of eating food sacrificed to idols. So by your knowledge, those weak believers for whom Christ died are destroyed. But when you thus sin against members of your family and wound their conscience when it is weak, you sin against Christ. Therefore, if food is a cause of their falling, I will never eat meat, so I may never cause one of them to fall. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I'd like to invite the children up for a message. Or not. <laughs> okay. Would you please rise for the gospel acclamation? <laughs> Lots of themes. One of those. 
those themes has been stories about people being possessed by demons. A common thread that runs through such movies is a priest figure yelling at a young woman while she writhes on the floor, chants in Latin. Maybe the most well-known movie with that theme was The Exorcist back in the 70s. I know about The Exorcist, not because I went to see it. That would never happen. I know about it because my friends went to see it and told me all about it. In fact, everyone, it seems, knew about The Exorcist. Maybe even some of you went to see it. And if you did, you were clearly braver and gutsier than me. In our scripture today, we have our own version of a demon story, but Mark doesn't follow the Hollywood formula for success. This time, it's a man possessed, and this time it isn't a priest who calls out the demon, it is Jesus. And the demon, in our story, is an unclean spirit. But the passage runs deeper than scary images of unclean spirits and demons. Remarkably, the unclean spirit in our story knows Jesus and calls him by name. No one else quite knows what to make of Jesus, but the demon does. We'll come back to that. The unclean spirit, who knows who Jesus is, challenges Jesus. Have you come to destroy us? When Jesus calls the spirit out of the man, those in the synagogue were amazed. They are amazed that the spirit listened and came out. And they even question the teaching of this Jesus. How is it that Jesus speaks with such authority that even the unclean spirits obey him? Jesus commands the unclean spirit to be silent and come out, and it does. Surprising, even shocking. Yet in hindsight, it really shouldn't be. After all, we know of other times in the teachings of Jesus where he speaks the words and others react. He tells the wind to be still and the storm subsides. He tells the lame to rise and they do. He calls a dead Lazarus out of the tomb and he lives. There is something about this Jesus, something about his authority. Last week, Pastor John told us that the Gospel of Mark was short and gets right to the point. Mark doesn't spend time telling about extra stuff. <coughs> He jumps right in and gets your attention. We are only at the 21st verse of the first chapter, barely scratching the surface of the story of Jesus, and already his authority is on center stage. Maybe then that's what the story is about. In some fashion, the story of Jesus is about the authority of Jesus. This unclean spirit had control over a man, Imagine this man's life, being held captive by the unclean spirit, being ostracized from his community, possibly being a danger to himself or to others. Imagine the pain and concern of those who love him as they wonder what will happen to him. And imagine this man having no control over his life and having no hope, no possibility of ever being free. But Jesus comes along, and the very first thing he does is cast out the unclean spirit. Jesus frees him from the bonds that hold him and restores him to himself, to his loved ones, and to his community. What the man could not do, what men and women could not do, Jesus does, because Jesus has authority. Perhaps that's why right here in the 21st verse, in the very first chapter, Mark starts Jesus' ministry with this story. Casting out an unclean spirit sets the tone for Jesus' mission and ministry. Mark establishes Jesus' authority from the very beginning. Jesus speaks and others listen, even unclean spirits. But not just a demon-possessed man in a faraway land almost 2,000 years ago, right here. Today, too, this act by Jesus reminds us that God stands faithfully with men and women possessed in ancient Palestine, but also with men and women today, here in West Salem. Through Jesus, God stands with each of us as we confront demons. 
God stands by our side, prepared to confront all the forces that keep us down, that rob us of abundant life, life that gives us meaning and purpose. We all have things in our lives that hold us captive, that rob us of abundant life. Some are obvious, and some are disguised or hidden. Things like addiction, illness, loss of a job, unsafe working conditions, situations where power is abused, where harassment and discrimination are tolerated, lack of access to housing, food, education, health care, conditions absent of the hope for a better future, or even our sense of helplessness and despair. We see a world fractured and broken, seemingly beyond any hope, and overwhelmed, we throw in the towel and give it all up. After all, we have no authority. All of these demons are capable of taking possession over me and creating the illusion that they are the authority by which I live my life. In our moments of weakness, we let them become our authority, and we become enslaved to this authority. Sometimes we don't even realize we are doing it. Isn't it ironic that in our scripture reading, it is those very demons who recognize the one true authority, and it isn't them. The demons know that Jesus Christ is the Holy One of God. Jesus Christ is a different authority. Jesus is the true authority. Now here's a spoiler alert. In the Gospel of Mark, the demons know who Jesus is. They know his authority. No one else knows. Not until Jesus dies on the cross. Because in the end, that is the source of Jesus' authority, his death and his resurrection. And that is what scares the demons. The demons who know who they are, and they know who Jesus is. But the good news is not just that Jesus is the true authority. The good news is that Jesus is a different kind of authority. Like the man in Mark, we too wrestle with demons. And like with that man, demons seek to possess us. They seek to make slaves of us. They seek to bring us death. But Jesus is different. Not only does Jesus not seek to enslave us, to lead us to death. Remember the cross? Jesus takes death on himself in the cross of Calvary. And there, Jesus defeats the power of the demons and brings us life. For nothing in life or death can separate us from the love of God through Jesus, not even the demons that threaten to enslave me. The authority of Jesus is the authority of a God who chooses to give his all, that we may have life. God comes for us, not only and not only for us, but for all of God's children, no matter whether they look like us, act like us, or think like us. God comes to free all his children from the bonds that hold us. God calls on the body of Christ, and you and me, to be difference makers, acting with courage to be God's hands in the world. God is indisputably for us in love, and God also loves passionately and deeply people who look and act and believe differently from us. Jesus comes to free us all, all of us, from the unclean spirits and robbers that seek to diminish the abundant life God has promised all. Jesus, the Holy One of God, the ultimate authority, is the authority that frees us frees us to be faithful, to be disciples, to be truly alive. Amen. As you are comfortable, please rise and join in the singing of the hymn, Lord, I Want to Be a Christian, found in your bulletin.
page 105 in the front of the room. I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified and died and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Confident that God, our light, and our salvation hears us when we pray, let us offer our prayers for the church, the world, and all in need. For those who speak your word throughout the church and the world, O God, for educational institutions that prepare leaders, that you will lift up prophets in our congregations.
You may be seated as the offering is received.
comment this morning. Please note that we have gluten-free wafers in addition to the standard wafers. We also have grape juice in addition to the wine. If you have need of those items, please indicate that to us as you come forward. For those of you who are visitors with us, please note the communion invitation in the bulletin. We do sincerely invite you to join with us. We who are many are one body, for we all partake of the one bread. Come, be filled with light and life. You may be seated.
As you are comfortable, would you please rise and would you pray for me? O morning star, fair and bright, you have refreshed us again with heavenly food. You are our dearest treasure. Go with us now, today, tomorrow, every day, that we tell the story of your never-ending love and sing your praise, both now and forever. Amen. The God of glory dwell in you richly, name you beloved, and shine brightly on your path. And the blessing of Almighty God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be upon with you and remain with you always. Amen. Amen. You may be seated for the announcements. Always lots of stuff going on, so please take the, uh, the bulletin home so you know the, uh, the events of the week. A couple things to highlight. Remember, once again, in the bulletin, as we do every week, there's a breath prayer on the bottom of the word pages. Um, take it home, cut it out, put it in your uh, uh, refrigerator or, or on your desk. Um, kind of commit it a little bit to memory and use it during the week as a, a prayer, just in those moments when you've got a moment to just kind of shoot out a little quick little breath prayer. That's in your bulletin. We're looking for, still looking for some participants for the Lenten dramas that begin February 21st. Ash Wednesday is February 14th, and the dramas begin the 21st and run for five weeks. So if you're interested in being part of a drama, kind of a reader's theater, uh, no memorization of lines, no fancy costumes or anything like that, um, <clears throat> let me know. Speak with me, and, and we'll get you some uh, um, volunteers for Coffee Fellowship. We're looking for that. Um, other, other things are in the um, bulletin as well. Remember, too, that following the 10.30 service this morning is the um, annual meeting, starting about 11.45. So if you want to come back for that, a um, couple things on the agenda that we need to address, we would love to have you with us. Our closing hymn is hymn number 538. As you are comfortable, would you please rise? <laughs> 